Let's do an incident response investigation. Let's walk back the hack to uncover how this hypothetical company had their domain controller compromised and their whole environment taken over. This is a free and online training lab that you can follow along with, link in the video description, called Poisoning the Well. This incident response lab allows for the investigation of logs from a cyber attack on a domain controller. We will analyze different logs to detect the initial access and intrusion all the way to the threat actor's compromise for domain admin. So first things first, we should download the logs. I do have these staged and set up inside of a Windows virtual machine. We can go open these and we can see all the different hosts and all the machines, all the endpoints that we might be able to dig into. Workstation number four is I believe where we're going first and you can see different Windows event viewer logs like the security log and even some sysmon logs and network traffic that we'll go explore. Now here's the storyline. The victim user is Jane Ross. We can look through the logs on her machine and we can uncover any suspicious activity and identify potentially malicious executables that have been ran on her workstation. With that, we can fire up the sysmon log and see what was happening on that device. By the way, not every organization has sysmon logging set up, configured, and enabled, but if you can, please, you absolutely should. I have this sysmon log open in the Windows Event Viewer, and even the very first entry here, the first record, describes an event ID 3 from sysmon, and that is network connectivity. So it says here, look, there's some information included with this event, with a technique included here, and actually some interesting details. This process, word.exe running out of the downloads folder from our Jane Ross user made a TCP connection from the host 10.0.0.9, likely a local IP address, that's probably Jane's machine herself, all the way out to this 13.107.253.40 IP address, a little bit odd, especially coming from word.exe. The lab exercise discusses this just as well. The note here of masquerading might mean that it's trying to deceive the end user, thinking, oh, it's Word or Microsoft Word being ran and executed, but Jane, that user, doesn't have any info on a program called word.exe, but she does use Word, oh, Microsoft Word, all the time. Maybe something is afoot here. We can go investigate those Wireshark logs, the packet capture, the network connectivity that was back and forth between this host and the others. So let's open that up and let's see if we can go filter and find that IP address. Let's say ip.source equals 10.0.0.9 and ip.destination, DST, that's the one, equals I'll paste in that IP address 13.107.253.40 or whatever. And it looks like there is a lot of communication. Uh, in fact, pretty constant communication. Uh, obviously, all of this is encrypted. You can see the TLS headers going back and forth in the application data, so this is not something that we can inspect or try to see the raw plain text data for, but clearly this is pretty constant. I don't know how well you can see my vertical scroll bar here, but there is a lot of communication throughout all the time included in this PCAP file. Now that on its own, just communication with an IP address doesn't definitively say, oh, that's malicious activity. We need to do some further investigation. So let's go open up one of the other logs. We can dig into the security event log from that host, workstation number four. So I'll fire that up and oh, there are a whole lot of entries in here, 28,560. This tracks all the different things like, oh, process termination, process creation, and that event ID for process creation is 4688. Eight. So what we might be able to do is actually filter this current event log. Let me go ahead and click this and for the event IDs that I want to narrow down on, let's do that 4688. I'll hit OK here and let's see it process all that. Now all we have are those process creation events. Now what I'm going to do, because we know we can narrow this down to just our word.exe process, let me simply try to find you can click that find button here. Let's look for our word.exe. I'll hit find next, and this might be a little bit chatty. There might be a whole lot of noise here as this all comes back because that process might do other things all on its own. Uh, looks like we do have a hit here. Yeah, okay, word.exe ends up firing up a new process, run DLL32 from the word.exe executable. So I do want to really look and kind of zoom in on how the word.exe process was created in the first place. What is its parent process above it that spawned and invoked it? So I'm going to find next and do this again. Looks like we see 
yet another run DLL32, and we can kind of keep following this process at least to find how the word.exe process started and fired up. Oh, but look at this, running cmd.exe, uh, that is a little bit sketch. Now we've got some more breadcrumbs that point to this being uh, not a good thing. Let's keep running find, more run DLL, called a con host, let's look again. Ooh, here it is. Okay, so the process is invoked now. Uh, Jane.ross is the user in her downloads directory running word.exe, but look at this creator process name here. You can see this is running out of C program files, Microsoft Office, root Office 16, winword.exe. That is the real and legitimate Microsoft Word executable, like the binary to run that application and program for Microsoft Word. But that means that Word, the real official one, spawned and invoked and created a new child process for our rogue anomalous Word.exe. That's probably malware, and that might clue us into, okay, maybe this was executed, ran and detonated by a malicious macro. Some of the code that you can run out of Office documents when they're enabled and executed. Looking back at the lab exercise here, they uncovered the exact same thing, but really that clues us in. The poor innocent victim, Jane Ross, was genuinely using the real Microsoft Word application, probably just to open a document for her work, but it fired and detonated another payload, word.exe, underneath it. So now we've got a little bit more clues here. And by the way, this whole activity, this whole lab exercise and training comes from anti-siphon training and a lot of their pay what you can training. Some of the great material put out by John Strand and his whole tribe of companies, the great folks that are doing great work with there. Take a look at their pay what you can training, where you can literally choose the price tag for any of the learning and education that you might like. And a lot of that education is already given out for free. Like seriously, I've just been looking through a GitHub repository that you can access, you can track down online. This is John Strand and his introductory class files. You can dig into the navigation and you can see all of the stuff that they showcase all for free, all that you can dig into and have some fun with, learn a whole lot of stuff. Huge thanks to Anti-Siphon Training, Black Hills Information Security, and all those great folks for sponsoring this video. Now we get to put on our detective hat. Let's kind of go ask Jane if she had recently downloaded or opened any Word documents. And she mentioned she did open a file from SharePoint. And you know SharePoint, that online cloud-based sort of file sharing service. So with that in mind, we could actually go work with, go take a look at and explore the audit log from SharePoint. Let me open that up in a text editor because it is just a giant CSV or comma separated value file. Oh goodness, there is a lot here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn Word Wrap off so we can see all of this all on their lines kind of horizontally here, uh, but look at this. There are about, okay, 500 entries in this and it's pretty tough to read. We can try to find a needle in the haystack here though because we already have some clues. The answer to the question though, how do you find a needle in a haystack is pretty simple. You just make the haystack smaller. So what we can do is we can zoom in on some of the context clues that we already have. We know our user, Jane.Ross, and we know that she tried to access or work with a file that was present on SharePoint. So let's start by just a simple control F and let's look for Jane.Ross. I'm using regular expressions here with a dot star on either end so we can find all of the lines that reference that user. I'll hit find all and then what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to copy with control C, open up a new document with control N and then paste in with control V. I'll turn word wrap off here so we can see just 21 lines now and that's a little bit easier to dig into. Now all of these operations that we can see, oh the user logged in, the user logged in, different timestamps, uh, but there's one interesting one down here called file accessed, right? So we can go kind of take a look at that line specifically. Here I'll highlight things as I move along. And you know what, let me put this on its own line externally so we can see that without the uh, word wrap mess. This is the entry for Jane.Ross accessing a file, that file accessed operation here. Now the very, very end of this, we can see the object ID. And that clues us in, that tells us, oh, this is the Infotech Express, likely the company and their SharePoint site accessing the financial records, shared documents of an HR complaint dated August 24th, 2023, .docx. Maybe that's it. 
Maybe that's the smoking gun. It is a .docx file, a Microsoft Word document after all. But I'm curious now, how did this document get onto SharePoint and how was it weaponized? How was it kind of backdoored and added with malware? So what I'm gonna do is now look for any other occurrences of that file accessed operation. Let's see if we can go track that down way back in the huge giant audit log. So let me control F for file accessed. I'll add my dot star decoration around the edges so I can go ahead and see what files might have been accessed, just those lines. Let's do that exact same process, open up another document, paste these all in, and let's display this a little bit better with word wrap. So only 13 entries here, but these are all the file accessed results. Uh, we see our Jane Ross hit right in the middle there, but there are a couple other interesting ones. Todd.Lee, Dale Clyde's, so other users in the environment, right? But we know that we're looking for that HR complaint, right? Can I control F and search for HR complaint? I can. There are a couple results for that. And let's filter and zoom in again, just looking for again, that exact string and nothing else. I only wanna find those lines and let's just filter these. So fewer results here, fewer hits, but take a look. Todd.Lee, that is the only user that ends up working with or staging that file before the victim Jane does. Uh, we could explore this a little bit further if we wanted to. I'm tabbing over to the right as much as I can here, but it's interesting because we can start to see some of the IP addresses that that user, Todd.Lee, interacted with SharePoint from. So we see a 20.169, but if I kind of keep tracking things, look, there's another hit from 172.173.214.112. So a different IP address from Todd Lee and another from Jane Ross. So that is interesting and more and more suspicious. If we got to take a look at the timestamps, if we made sense of all those columns and rows and that giant CSV file, we'd see that those events maybe occurred within like a two minute time frame. Say Todd, that, okay, maybe rogue actor, logged in from two different locations, different IP addresses, and while sure that's possible, it's not really probable and very unlikely. And Jane tells us, hey, the file that she downloaded was an HR complaint that needed to be updated and signed. And seemingly, this is our smoking gun. Say that Todd's account was compromised and the threat actor staged this HR complaint document with a macro so that it could execute code all from this Word document. Now we're starting to understand more of the scope of this incident here. Our investigation, our analysis is bringing us to new places, but we have to think that threat actor, the hacker and adversary is probably gonna do some more damage, right? Maybe they've done some lateral movement, but they'll probably try to do some privilege escalation. Hey, they compromised, sure, Todd and then Jane, but they wanna become an admin. And of course, this organization is working within an active directory domain. They're keeping track of their users, groups, everything with a domain controller. And now there might be another attack up against the whole crown jewel. The keys to the kingdom here are the domain controller and a lot of the protocols that it uses, right? Like Kerberos, granting Kerberos tickets for different access. But we receive reports of some unexpected Kerberos tickets requests originating from Jane Ross, the compromised user, to an SPN or service principal name admin account. Let's get back to our investigative logs here. Let's check it out for the domain controller and let's open up the security event log. Goodness, 144,000 events in here. Let's see how we can kind of cut this up. Let's see if we can simply start to find our jane.ross and let's see if we can track anything down here. Uh, a couple interesting gimmicks. Pre-authentication failed. Maybe that one's not all that interesting. Let's find again. Oh, here's one. A Kerberos service ticket was requested from jane.ross at lab local requesting from DC1. Let's kind of keep looking to see if there are more breadcrumbs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A Kerberos authentication ticket. TGT was requested. Jane.ross from curb TGT. And I'm curious, what did they pull that from? So let's find again. Here's the kicker. A Kerbro service ticket was requested from jane.ross, lab.local, pulling from the service name joanne.king. Other additional information, we have the ticket encryption code, hex value of 17, that's worth noting, because the lab fills us in a little bit more here. They obtained a Kerberos service ticket from Joan King, who as an admin, probably had created a service principle maybe from installing software somewhere else in the domain. Now, there's no reason for Jane, the user, to request a ticket. And this likely confirms that threat actor tried to Kerberos, tried some technique, some tradecraft to escalate privileges to a higher level account, like Joan King, the admin. 
There is a little tidbit here from uh, the encryption type, Hex 17. Let me check this out. This is an awesome write-up from Red Siege, which I'm wearing their shirt, by the way. Hey, love you guys. Uh, and Tim Medine. Tim Medine, you know, the guy that, like, invented Kerberosing. All this write-up, all this text and great knowledge on how you might be able to detect Kerberosing. Really cool, kind of digging into the details as to what logs and artifacts you can key off of. So totally recommend you go check that out. The lab mentions this just a little bit that, hey, that hex 17 encryption type isn't like a real definitive indicator that, oh, this was a Kerberos attack, but it does help build a little bit more of a picture here. And if we wanted to, we could reference the sysmon logs to see any other network requests, but there weren't anything worthwhile and, hey, maybe saving us some time for our investigation, but it is worthwhile to try to investigate and cross-correlate between different log sources. Now, here is the finale, and this is a big one, right? Our threat actor has gained access to Joan King, who is a domain admin and can do anything they want on the domain. So what they'll do is perform a DC sync attack. Domain controller synchronization is when it just shares all of the information that it has, everything that's been storing and keeping track of for users, computers, groups, anything, and just giving it to another resource. This is essentially a dump of everything in the domain. So we've now uncovered the Kerberosing attack and they probably cracked the hash for the service principal name that they needed here. Looks like Joan informed the the password was simply summer 2023. That's bad. That's dumb. Don't do that because that is an easily crackable password, always season and year. Don't follow that schema. So maybe our threat actor used the compromised admin account to perform this DC sync attack that will gain access to all of the user accounts and their NTLM hashes so that they can pillage the village, do whatever they want, be whoever they want. We can review this if we look back at the network traffic from the domain controller. Let's open that up within Wireshark and let's try to see, are there any indicators that something sketchy is going on from our DC? The lab write-up does something a little bit interesting here, and they're noting that, hey, the look of the Wireshark traffic might clue you in that this is a DC sync attack, and that, oh, you kind of have a zebra stripe pattern with a couple variations. I don't know how definitive you could really use that for, but they do note that the protocol, DCERPC, is really the communications from the domain controller, and we might be able to zoom in on that. So if we start scrolling through our Wireshark traffic, we can probably drill down and go find, oh, those DCE RPC packets. And you'll see that zebra shape start to take form on the right-hand side. Look at all these communications back and forth. DCE RPC, DCE RPC, sending data, getting that out and about. Here's a get domain controller info request and response. Oh, and here's a kicker, DNS bind request and get NC changes. Now the lab write-up notes here that this pairing, oh, DS bind request followed by a DS get NC changes can be legitimate network activity. Like it's part of normal operations of a Windows domain controller. But we have to keep that in mind with context. The danger level of these requests really depends on whether or not they're part of a planned and authorized action or if it's an anomaly. If a DC sync was literally part of your operations, legitimate purposes, then there's no concern. But it might still be a little bit of a breadcrumb to sketch things out. End of the story here though, that DC sync was not scheduled and our threat hacker, the hacker and adversary, has completely taken over the entire domain. And that is a bad day or week or month for that organization. Uh, but for us, for this learning exercise, this training lab and our own education, this hopefully clued you in on some of the things that we might be able to do to cut up and dig through logs, use those context clues and breadcrumbs to zoom in, narrow and filter down on what's important to us to uncover the thread here. Find the needle in the haystack. And hey, this is all thanks to Black Hills Information Security, Anti-Siphon Training, all those tribe of companies and their pay what you can training to make all this education, all this learning accessible for us at whatever price makes sense for you. So seriously, if you are loving this work, if you had a lot of fun with this exercise, please do check out the link below. See what pay what you can training can help you learn for your organization, your business, and the whole company in the world to protect cybersecurity in our landscape. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Like, comment, subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one.